This is the Fujifilm Finepix S1 Pro, except it's also a Nikon. Here's the catch though, the fact that this is a Nikon isn't even close to being the weirdest thing about it. In fact, I think it might be the weirdest device I've ever owned. This camera came out in the beginning of the year 2000 when digital was in its infancy, and you can see that pretty clearly. In fact, that's a big part of the reason that it's a Nikon. See, while Nikon and Canon were leading the charge with high-tech, cutting-edge digital cameras 20-25 years ago, Fujifilm lagged behind a little bit. They didn't have top-of-the-line modern cameras, and I think that the last film camera Fujifilm made was the Fujika AX Multi program in like 1985, a whole 15 years before this came out. But that doesn't mean that Fujifilm were complete Luddites. They were known for making film, not cameras. And what they're still known for to this day is making amazing sensors with amazing color science. So when they came up with a digital sensor for this that was to some extent revolutionary, they needed a proper camera body to put it in. Knowing that they didn't have the expertise to make a new camera all of their own, they reached out to the big boys in yellow at the top, Nikon. What we ended up with was essentially the body from a Nikon N60 or F60, depending on the country. That's right, a Nikon film body with a Fujifilm sensor, screen, and computer sort of just um, glued in. And sure, it's not unheard of for camera brands to collaborate. I mean, look at the Hasselblad X-Pan that's also a Fujifilm. But this is a lot weirder. For starters, despite saying Fujifilm at the top, down the bottom, it says Nikon F-mount, and it takes Nikon F-mount glass, which I'm not complaining about. And largely, the actual photo-taking experience is kind of completely separate from the sensor and the computer inside, which means that shooting it feels very much just like shooting a Nikon. Because it is. But because the camera and the brain are kind of separate entities, you end up with some of the weirdest quirks I've ever seen in a device, starting with batteries. Believe it or not, this camera takes not one, not two, but three different flavors of battery. It needs two CR123A cells to run the camera bit, four AA batteries to run the computer brain bit, and one of those little CR2025 cell batteries to keep the clock going and retain your settings. For a grand total of seven batteries in this camera. Speaking of power, one way that I like to power up my brain is with Magic Mind, the nootropic drink designed specifically for creatives and the sponsor of today's video. I've been having a daily shot of this tasty green stuff for over a month now, and let me tell you, they don't call it magic for no reason. It's allowed me to lock in, get my scripts done on time, come up with cool video ideas like this one, and weirdly, it's even helped my sleep by smoothing out my caffeine hit compared to, say, I don't know, a criminally high consumption of energy drinks. And aside from all the magic brain power ingredients, I also really like that it's packed with vitamin C and D and loads of other letters, which keeps my immune system fighting fit and well, and we all know, coming into autumn, we all kind of need that right now. I can't recommend it enough, so check out the link below and use the code STAYHYDRATED20 for a discount. If you've ever played around with digital gear this old before, you'll know that one of the big challenges when it comes to actually using the damn thing is obsolescence. A lot of the time, even if the camera is completely fine, finding a replacement lithium battery that old is next to impossible. So I'm actually kind of grateful that this camera uses mostly readily available batteries still today. The other challenge with obsolescence is dealing with obsolete media. And look, I am no stranger to old storage, okay? My first video games installed off of floppy disk. But this camera uses one of the weirdest memory cards I have ever seen. Opening up the back of the camera, you can see that there's dual card slots, but don't get too excited. You can't record to both at the same time. You can just have two cards in it. You have to pick which media you're recording to in the menu. Thankfully, Fujifilm saved this camera from becoming a shelf queen by including a compact flash slot, a media that has somehow stood the test of time and is still readily available today. But what's in the other card slot? This is a 16 megabyte smart media card which at the camera's highest quality settings can store a whopping and completely usable four images. The weirdest thing about this card isn't the capacity though. 16 megabytes was pretty standard back in the day for a smaller card. The weirdest thing is the design. I mean, just look how thin it is. I mean, sure, 
Back in the year 2000, having that much storage on a card this slim was a bit of a flex. Okay, but for something you're going to be handling and taking in and out of the camera and maybe carrying spares, this thing feels so fragile. And apparently, it is, especially when it comes to static electricity, which can fry them. For fun, here's a 128 gigabyte micro SD card, which costs under $20 today and has over 8,000 times more storage capacity. And so after learning all that, you might assume that this camera is a bit of a dinosaur and you're mostly wrong. This camera actually has a few really nice to have features like the threaded shutter release, which isn't on the Nikon N60 or F60. It has a nice diopter adjustment on the viewfinder and my favorite has a pop-up flash. I know that it's not professional, but I like them. And it has some absolutely useless features like this obsolete USB-ish proprietary data connector, this absolutely obsolete video out connector, and this absolutely obsolete DC in connector. The actual shooting experience is very much the same as a Nikon film camera from the same era, as you would expect. It's got a really great light meter, the viewfinder is nice and clear, the ergonomics are great, it's got pretty decent single point autofocus as long as your subject's not moving, in fact, I dug up some reviews of this camera from when it came out in the year 2000 for an RRP of $3,995. And one of the big complaints back then was the viewfinder. Since the sensor isn't full frame, which we'll get to, but obviously the camera body is designed for film, which of course is full frame, they actually just put like a mask in the viewfinder to make it smaller. And for most people that might be annoying, but since I wear big glasses, it actually made it easier to see the whole picture right to the edge of the frame and the exposure information for me. It's funny, using this side by side with my main stills camera that I use professionally, the Nikon D750, this feels like borderline modern to shoot. Apart from the absolutely, definitively superior shutter sound. But as soon as you start to try to use any of the digital parts of the camera, it's a bit of a different story. The menu is okay and it's pretty responsive and looks absolutely period correct in the best kind of way. But most of your actual shooting settings take place on this little LCD that's above the main screen. Here you can select your ISO, your drive mode and color settings, stuff like that. Oh, and you'll notice that on this screen, there's a separate different battery indicator to the one on the LCD of the top plate. I think the one on the top plate does the CR123s and the one on the back screen does the double A's, but I'm not sure. Things really start to go a bit sideways when you've taken a picture and you go to review it using the screen on the back. Pro tip, don't bother. Once you've taken a photo, if you're shooting high quality TIFFs like I am, it takes about 15 seconds just to save from the camera to the memory card. And then if you wait for that to finish and press the play button on the back to review your image, it takes about 30 seconds to load the image. This was, I have to admit, pretty annoying at first, but I actually kind of got used to it and kind of like it. It makes shooting this camera an extremely intentional and thoughtful process. I spend way longer really considering my framing and each shot checking my exposure and being really careful with it. I mean, this camera is for sure the slowest camera I have ever used, period. And uh, that's including the RB67. It's funny, you know, I've talked about this before, but you know how people say they shoot film to slow down? I can go through a whole roll on my K1000 before I've taken five pictures on this with image review. But okay, the real question we're all asking right now though is how do the photos look? Do they have that magic Fujifilm color? Do they have that mythical CCD pop? Well, kinda. I used two lenses on this camera. I used my Nikon 16mm fisheye, which on this, because it's an APC-ish sensor, is equivalent to about a 24mm fisheye. And I used my Sigma 50mm 1.4 art, which is roughly a 75mm lens on this. Importantly, if you're thinking about picking one of these up, S1 Pro will only autofocus with screw drive lenses, like the Nikon D lenses, so anything newer than the D lenses is gonna be manual focus only. I don't mind manual focusing, but it's definitely something to think about based on what lenses you already have. That being said, I think the Screwdrive Nikon D lenses are some of the best value lenses out there right now, especially the 24mm 
and the 16 fisheye, they are amazing quality for the price. How do the images look? Well, you're looking at some of them now and some of them have required a little bit of processing. Some of them have required a lot of processing, but ultimately I think it does have that classic CCD look that we can all sort of recognize but can't agree on. And that brings us to the question, is this camera actually usable now in 2024? Like, could you use this camera as your camera? Or is it just a toy for fun? And look, I think you totally can, with some caveats. Sure, this camera is not something I would ever, ever turn up to a professional shoot with as my main camera, but for walking about town, taking pictures of the leaves falling off the trees and cups of coffee, I know that a lot of us have like a really bad case of gas, myself included, even though I've made videos about not buying more gear. But the fact is, if you're a working professional photographer and you use cameras that are technically fantastic, but kind of boring, like the Nikon D750, I think it's important to have a few cameras that you absolutely can't use professionally so that you can go and take photos for fun without your brain feeling like you're working. And this camera achieves that without a doubt. The images that come out of it are perfectly fine to stick on Instagram or even on a website or a YouTube video like this one without doing anything to them. But now with a lot of these AI tools that we all love to hate, uh, upscaling these images is like totally a thing that you can do and they look great. Here's the really weird part. A big part of the look of the images that come out of this camera comes from the absolutely unhinged sensor design. This camera very proudly contains a super CCD sensor which is flat out bonkers. Basically, instead of the pixels being squares arranged in a grid, you know, like pixels are supposed to be, the pixels are fucking octagonal and they're laid out in like a honeycomb kind of pattern. In fairness, Fujifilm weren't being totally just silly goofy when they did this. And it was actually a pretty clever idea. It allowed them to boost the usable ISO on this camera up to 1600, which is pretty impressive for back in the day. And I think 1600 doesn't look too bad on this camera. And it allowed them to say that the camera was 6.2 megapixels. Whether it's actually 6.2 megapixels is up for debate, since the images obviously have to be square pixels in a grid, but the sensor isn't. The camera does have to do some level of making stuff up to fill in the blanks between the pixels. So while you can put it in a six megapixel mode, I think the general consensus that people have reached is that the actual output resolution of this camera, somewhere around the four megapixel mark when you set it to that. I personally shoot this camera set to the three megapixel mode because I think it gives you a cleaner image. And then I just upscale them using Photoshop, which despite how we all feel about Adobe, is better at interpolation and upscaling than this camera from 25 years ago. And even though this camera is old and heavy and slow, I just really enjoy taking photos with it. There's something about the limitations, the barely usable image review and the low res images that just gets me. It might be nostalgia, but I think more than that is knowing that the results of this camera are gonna be quirky, they're gonna be unique and they're not gonna have the flexibility that I'm used to, just helps me focus a lot less on the little details and focus a lot more on just having fun, taking pictures and seeing what happens, being a bit more experimental and a bit looser with it. It also makes me really appreciate the times when camera manufacturers have come together to make something really cool like this. Fuji working with Nikon now seems ridiculous, even if maybe Nikon should have called in a few favors about the dials on the ZF. And with Nikon acquiring red lately, Let's just say I hope sometime soon I can show you a Nikon digital body with the guts of a red pasted in or a Komodo with a Z mount. Who knows where the future of cameras go from here, but one thing is for sure, it's always going to be important to stay hydrated and create art.